Dumb Witness. My friend Poirot has a particular routine when he opens his morning correspondence. He picks up each letter, scrutinizes the postmark, mm-hmm. neatly slits the envelope open with his paper knife, peruses the letter minutely, mm-hmm. places it delicately on one of the four piles beyond the toast rack, and takes a sip of his breakfast chocolate. But on this particular occasion, he paused, read the letter through again, and passed it over to me. Tell me what you think, mon ami. Mm. It's just like my great aunt Maud's writing, as if a spider had got into the ink pot. Can't you just tell me what it says? I should prefer you to form your own judgment. Mm, very well. Uh, dear sir, after much doubt and indecision, I am emboldened to write to you. You were mentioned to me by a Miss Fox of Exeter, and although she was not herself acquainted with you, she mentioned that her brother-in-law's sister, whose name I'm sorry to say I cannot recall... Does she ever get to the point? Patience, my friend, patience. Mm. In my present dilemma, it occurs to me that you might undertake the necessary investigations on my behalf. Uh, What dilemma? Have I missed a sheet? No, 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 you must persevere. (sighs) It is quite impossible for me to consult anyone here at Market Basing, but you will naturally understand from your great experience that I feel uneasy and ever since the incident of the dog's ball, increasingly alarmed. Perhaps you would kindly let me know what your fees are and what you would advise me to do in the matter. I remain yours faithfully, Emily Arundel. But Poirot, what is all this about? Is there something I've missed? The date, Hastings. The date. Um. April 17th. And today is June 28th. The letter was written over two months ago. Oh. Why was it not sent? Uh, I suppose the old biddy changed her mind. Then why post it now? Are you going to answer it? No, Hastings. We must go down to Market Basing. You mean now? Today? Why not? It would be better than stifling here in London. <laughs> would not the country be more agreeable? Uh, shall we go in the car? Excellent. I will get my overcoat and scarf. But we're not going to the North Pole. Ah, one must always be careful of catching the chill. Well, have it your own way. You'll probably die of heat exhaustion. Market Basing was a charming little place that had long ago abandoned any attempt to keep up with modern life and had hidden itself away from the busy Great West Road behind a secluded bypass. We found Little Greenhouse easily enough, but a surprise awaited us. To be let or sold. Gabler and Scuttle. On the other side of the fence, a wire-haired terrier came rushing up. (laughs) old chap, you're doing a really splendid job guarding the house. (laughs) The incident of the dog's ball. Well, at least we have the dog. So, uh, what next? A little call on Gabler and Scuttle? Mm Hmm. That seems indicated. The house agent was obviously looking for a quick sale. Poirot's correspondent, Emily Arundel, had died rather unexpectedly and the property had been left to her companion, a Miss Lawson, but it was far too big for her needs. It sounds exactly what I am looking for. Could you give me an order to view? And to my astonishment... Poirot gave his name as Signor Parotti. Ah, Mr Gabler will be pretty disappointed when we don't go back. I think he feels Little Green House is as good as sold. Yes, I fear there is a deception in store for him. Ah, I suppose we may as well have lunch here before going back to London. My dear Hastings, I am not proposing to leave Market Basing so quickly. Hmm. We have not yet accomplished what we came to do. But, my dear fellow, it's all a washout. The old lady's dead. Precisely. But if she's dead, then what's the point? Whatever the trouble was, it's over and finished with. Oh, how carelessly you put the matter aside, Hastings. Let me tell you this. No matter is ever over and finished with until Hercule Poirot ceases to concern himself with it. So, where do we go now? A spot of lunch, perhaps? No. First... We will visit the churchyard. It may have something to tell us. Sacred to the memory of Emily Harriet Laverton, Arundel died May the 1st, 1936. And her letter to me was dated April 17th. 
and I did not receive it until today. You see, do you not, my friend, that there is a mystery to be explained? So, let us fortify ourselves with a bon biftec and a glass of wine. Since Poirot was obviously determined to leave no stone unturned, we booked into the George, a rambling old inn on the market square. I should have known from the smell of stale food clinging to the walls what lunch would be like. Mutton, large slabs of watery cabbage and dispirited potatoes. But the asthmatic elderly waiter turned out to be a mine of information and it appeared that old Miss Arundel had been a very wealthy woman indeed. The fact that she had left both her house and her fortune to her middle-aged housekeeper and not to her own flesh and blood had caused a considerable scandal in market basing. After lunch was over, Poirot led the way briskly down to Little Green House, holding his order to view firmly in his hand. Oh, you must be Mr Perotti, the house agent telephoned. Please come in, gentlemen. If you'd care to follow me, I'll take you round. Everything was spotlessly clean. Poirot and I behaved in the customary way of being shown round houses, muttering things like, very nice, and a most pleasant room. This is the dining room, sir. Uh, uh, and those are the Arundel family pictures. Mm-hmm. That's the late mistress. And those are her three sisters. She outlived them all. Uh, and that's her father, the old general. He was out in India at the time of the Great Mutiny, so I've heard. <laughs> Bob, you <laughs> naughty dog. Don't don't mind him, sir. He won't do you no harm. Hello, Bob. Oh, nice little fellow, aren't you? And this is the drawing room. Oh. Well, what does he find so interesting about that little table? It's after his ball, sir. It was always kept in that drawer while the mistress was alive. It isn't there any longer. Bobsy's ball's in the kitchen. In the kitchen, Bobsy. <laughs> You were with your mistress a long time. Uh, oh, pardon, I do not know your name. Ellen, sir. I've been here 22 years. And supposing I were to buy this house, Ellen, would you stay on? Oh, it's very kind of you, sir, but I'm going to retire from service. I'm only staying here as a convenience to Miss Lawson until the place is sold. Was your mistress's illness a long and painful one? No, I wouldn't say that, sir. She'd been ailing, if you know what I mean, for a long time. Ever since two years ago, when she had the jaundice. Ah, yes. But she got over that, and her brain was as keen as anything. So, what was this last illness of hers? It was the same sort of thing, sir. That nasty yellow colour again, and the terrible sickness and all the rest of it. Ah, Brought it on herself, poor soul, eating a lot of things she shouldn't have done. That very evening she was taken ill, she'd had curry for supper. Well, what's that? Oh, it's only Bob. He's got hold of that ball of his and pushed it down the stairs. It's a favourite game of his. Come and see. What's he want? Throw the ball up to him, sir. There you are, boy. (laughs) And now he'll give it a push with his nose and watch it bounce down the stairs. (laughs) <laughs> He'd have you playing that game all day, sir. That'll do now, Bobsy. Come down and get your ball. <laughs> Would you care to see the upstairs rooms, gentlemen? Uh, we'd love to, I'm sure. Uh, Lead the way, mademoiselle. This was Miss Arundel's room, sir. We call it the yellow room. And is this where she died? Yes, sir. Tell me, Ellen, had Miss Lawson been with your mistress long? Only about a year, sir. That was why it came as such a surprise. What came as a surprise? The mistress leaving her everything, sir. Her nephew and her nieces had always understood the entire fortune would be divided between them when she died. They'd been counting on it, so to speak. Her nephew and her nieces? Mr Charles Arundel and his sister, Teresa, and Bella Tanyos. She married a foreigner. I don't think the mistress ever really approved of him. Your mistress must have been unusually attached to Miss Lawson, then. Oh, I don't think so. She's quite an ordinary sort of person. Oh, you like her? There isn't anything to like or dislike. A regular fussy old maid with her head stuffed with nonsense about spirits. Spirits? 
Yes, sir. Sitting round a table and dead people come back and talk to you. And was Miss Arundel a believer too? Oh, Miss Lawson would have liked her to be, but the mistress had too much good sense. Mind you, I don't say it didn't amuse her, particularly with the others as serious as death about it. The others? The two Misses Tripp. They live in Sheep Street. They're always going in for these seance things. They even had one in this very house the night the mistress was taken so poorly. They actually had a seance here? Yes, sir. And they got all excited about some green light they said was hanging about the mistress's head. It was all nonsense, of course, but Miss Lawson lapped it up. We did not linger over the other bedrooms, but as we were about to descend the stairs... Oh, oh what is it, mon ami? I nearly slipped on something. It's Bob's ball. Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. I should have warned you. Bob has a habit of leaving his ball at the top of the stairs. The poor mistress had a nasty fall through it. Might easily have been the death of her. Was she badly hurt? Oh, not as much as you'd think. Very lucky she was, Dr Granger said. She was in bed for about a week, but it wasn't serious. Was this long ago? Just a week or two before she died. Oh. Is something the matter, Parotti? Have you dropped something? Uh, my fountain pen had uh, slipped out of my pocket. Shall we carry on downstairs, gentlemen? Of course. He is careless, this master of Bob. Oh, it wasn't really his fault, sir. He wasn't to know that the mistress didn't sleep very well and would often go downstairs and wander about the house. I should like to take another look at the drawing room, if I may. Of course, sir. Uh, did your mistress seem unduly perturbed about Bob and his ball after the accident? Oh, yes, sir. It worried her a lot. Mm. When she was dying, she was rambling on about Bob and the ball and a picture that was a jar. A picture that was a jar? Mm. Uh, observe this very curious china ornament, Hastings. I don't see anything remarkable about it. But the picture of the morose-looking bulldog on the lid is very charming. <sighs> Out all night and no key, it says. Does Bob sometimes stay out all night, Helen? He has done, sir, once or twice. As a matter of fact, he was out the night of the mistress's accident. He came home about five. Miss Lawson went down to let him in before he woke everybody up with his barking. And she didn't want a mistress to know about it because she thought it might upset her. I see. Helen, do you know anything about this letter? Oh, well, I never did. Are you the gentleman this letter was written to, Mr Hercules Poirot? Yes, I am Hercule Poirot. You see, sir, I didn't know what to do about it. When Miss Lawson was turning out things after the mistress's death, there was this little papier mâché blotter Miss Arundel used when she was writing her letters in bed, and... Yes, Helen, go on. Miss Lawson didn't want it for herself, so she gave it to me, and I put it away in a drawer. It wasn't until yesterday that I took it out. thought I ought to put some new blotting paper in it. And I found the letter tucked away inside it. I, I didn't rightly know what to do with it. I couldn't take it upon myself to open it. So I put a stamp on it and posted it. Amazing how simple an explanation can be. I am in a dilemma, Ellen. This letter was a commission with which Miss Arundel wished to entrust me. Perhaps I should consult her lawyer. Oh, th that would be Mr Purvis from Archester. It was him she sent for after the fall, she had. What, the fall down the stairs? Yes. When did he come, exactly? The day after the Easter bank holiday, after the family had gone back. The family? The nieces and nephew, Miss Bella, or Mrs Tanios, I should say, Miss Teresa and Mr Charles. And that was the last your mistress saw of them? Oh, no, sir. Dr Tanios and Bella came again the next weekend because they were worried about Miss Arundel. And what about Mr. Charles and Miss Teresa? They came the weekend after, the weekend before she died. Eh bien, the information you have given me has been invaluable, Ellen, oh. and the mystery of the letter has been solved. Thank you for all your help. What? And you too, Bob. <laughs> you love your mistress, even if you did sometimes stay out all night. Brave dog.
Well, Poirot, I hope you're satisfied now. All the mysteries explained, the delayed letter, and even the incident of the dog's ball. No, Hastings, I am not satisfied. For I know one little thing that you do not. And what's that? There is a nail driven into the skirting board at the top of the stairs. Why shouldn't there be? And it was carefully varnished so as not to be noticed. Was that what you were looking at when you pretended you were picking up your fountain pen? What are you trying to tell me? If you wished to stretch a length of cord or wire across the top of the stairs, you could tie it on one side to the banister, but on the other, you would need something like a nail to attach it to. But why should anyone want to do that? Someone had observed Bob's habit of leaving his ball at the top of the stairs. A dangerous thing to do. It might lead to an accident. And this gave our would-be murderer an idea. Murderer? Yes, Hastings. I believe it was an attempt at murder. Miss Arundel was in the habit of coming out of her room at night and wandering about the house. A wire stretched across the top of the stairs would be a very effective way of pitching her down head foremost. And when the household came rushing out, the murderer would produce the cause of the accident. Bob's ball. How horrible. Taking advantage of a poor, innocent dog. Mm -hmm. But Miss Arundel was very little hurt, and she was a very quick-witted old lady. She knew that she had not slipped on Bob's ball, and she remembered him barking to be let in the following morning. Out all night and no key, like the dog on the china jar. Not a jar, as Ellen thought. Oh, it's all highly ingenious, and I take my hat off to you. And I'm sure it must be a great disappointment that the old lady died a natural death. Shall we go back to London now? If you show the dog the rabbit, my friend, he does not go back to London. He goes down the rabbit hole. What rabbit hole? Let us go and talk to Dr. Granger, who attended Miss Arundel in her last illness. What can I do for you, gentlemen? You look healthy enough to me. <laughs> to my amazement, instead of inventing some medical pretext, Poirot launched into the most extraordinary farrago of nonsense. I am writing a book on the life of General Arundel, who played such a fascinating role in the history of the Indian mutiny. Old Arundel? He lived just up the road, a little greenhouse, but he was a good deal before my time. Uh, you knew his daughter, however, the late Miss Arundel. Yes, I knew her very well. Uh, you understand it has been a severe blow to me to find that Miss Arundel has so recently died. My research, with which he would have been invaluable... Quite, but I don't see what I can do about it. The General has no sons or daughters living? No, all dead, the lot of them. And in the next generation? Charles Arundel and his sister Teresa, but I doubt whether they'd be much use to you. The younger generation doesn't take much interest in its grandfathers. And there's Mrs. Tanios, but I doubt whether you get much out of her either. There might have been family papers, documents. Well, there might have been, but most of the stuff was cleared out and burned after Emily's death. But uh, what's so special about old Arundel? I wouldn't have thought anybody could possibly find anything interesting in him. Ah, but is there not a saying that history knows nothing of its greatest men? Recently, certain papers have come to light which show that the general played a vital role which makes his story of the greatest interest to the present time. <laughs> you amaze me. All I know about his part in the mutiny is that he was a prize bore on the subject. Who told you that? Miss Peabody. You might call on her, I suppose. She knew all of the Arundel's intimately and is a tremendous gossip. Eventually, after a good deal of floundering around, Poirot did manage to get round to the subject of the old lady's death. The verdict was exactly as I had predicted. Nothing very unexpected about it. She'd been poor health for years. Liver trouble. She always managed to pull through before, but this time she didn't. That's all there is to be said. I heard some story that she had quarrelled with her family. Well, she didn't actually quarrel with them, as far as I know. But I understand she left her money away from the family. Yes, odd thing to do. Left it all to her frightful, fluttering hen of a companion. Yes. One can imagine such a thing happening... An insignificant woman who had managed to gain a great ascendancy over her. Ascendancy? <laughs> Nothing of the sort. Emily Arundel treated Miss Lawson worse than a stray cat. You seem to have got hold of the most extraordinary ideas. Oh, I'm sorry you do not think my little fiction well-imagined, Hastings. I was rather pleased with it. <laughs> so, what do we do now? We go to see Miss Peabody. And do you propose to tell her the same story? Of course. If one is going to tell a lie, one might as well be consistent. 
Going to write a book, eh? Yes, madam. In English? Yes, certainly. But you're a foreigner. <laughs> you is secretary? Uh, yes, I am. Can you speak English? <laughs> I should hope so. Where'd you go to school? Eton. Then you can't. But before I could leap to the defence of my alma mater, Miss Peabody had turned to the matter in hand. She had precious little to say about the general, but a good deal about Miss Arundel's siblings. Emily had three sisters. They all died some years ago and left her most of their money, so she was a very wealthy woman. And there was a brother, Thomas. Nobody thought he'd ever marry, and it came as a terrible shock when he did, especially the wife he chose. Oh, why was that, madame? Her name was Mrs Varley supposed to have murdered her husband with arsenic. Thomas got quite obsessed with her. He used to get all the papers and cut out all her photographs. And when she was acquitted, Thomas, who couldn't say boo to a goose, went off to London and asked her to marry him. And he'd never met her before in his life. And was it a happy marriage? Well, they had two children. Charles and Teresa. I suppose they came to see their aunt a good deal? Not until their parents were dead. Emily was all alone in the world by then, and they and Bella Briggs were all the kith and kin she had. Bella Briggs? Emily's niece, the daughter of her sister Arabella. Made a fool of herself. Married some foreign doctor who was studying at the university in London. Well, I don't suppose Bella had many chances. And has that been a happy marriage? I wouldn't say that for certain about any marriage. They live in Smyrna, but they're still over here at the moment. Came to stay with Emily for Easter, but I expect that now they know they're getting nothing out of Emily's will, they'll be on their way back. And uh, did Miss Arundel leave a very considerable fortune? Yes, and that's caused all the bother. No one ever suspected the Lawson woman would get it all. Did it come as a surprise to you? Well, to tell you the truth, it did. Emily had always said that her money would be divided equally between her two nieces and her nephew. And that's the way it was in her original will. And then, quite out of the blue, ten days before her death, she sends for her solicitor and makes a new will. The family was thunderstruck. And the Lawson creature seemed more surprised than anybody. Has there been any attempt to question the will? Teresa's taken counsel's opinion, I believe. A lot of good that'll do her. What kind of person is she? Teresa? She's rather an exotic creature. Inherited a small fortune from her father and got through it in no time. She lives life to the full, so long as someone's prepared to pay for it. And her brother Charles? A charming fellow, but no good. Always hard up, always in debt, always returning like a bad penny from all over the world. My, mind you, I can't help liking the rogue. Going to get in touch with him? Well, it seems to me possible that he might have some family papers relating to his grandfather. Well, he's more likely to have made a bonfire of them. Well, I must not trespass any longer on your time, madame. I hope I've told you what you wanted to know. Though we don't seem to have got down to talking about the Indian mutiny. Hmm. What have you found out about the part the general played in it all? Oh, I am still in the early stages of my research, madame. I shall be very curious to know what you come up with. Send me a copy of the book when it comes out. <clears throat> Something tells me she didn't find your story entirely convincing. You think not? So, what local celebrity do we try next? I think we should pay a little call on Lady Demoiselle Tripp. The spiritualist ladies? <laughs> must be joking. We must leave no stone unturned, Hastings. What an unbelievably ghastly pair. <laughs> I am very glad we did not accept their invitation to dinner. <laughs> Shredded raw vegetables. <laughs> Mon Dieu. <laughs> Oh, they clearly thought the world of Miss Wilhelmina Lawson. Such a rare soul, so simple, so earnest. <laughs> but clearly Miss Arundel did not share their convictions. She was obviously stringing them along, pretending to go along with it all, and then suddenly coming out with, what was their word for it? Something ribald. <laughs> uh, 
And yet that seance on the night Miss Arendt was taken ill. There was a kind of halo round her head, a sign that she was about to pass over. <laughs> there is something curious there. Well, she hasn't sent them a message to say she's been murdered. So, uh, what orders for your chauffeur now? You will be glad to hear, Hastings, that for the time being we have finished with market basing. We can return to London. Well, at least you've enjoyed your little busman's holiday. You do not think I am serious, my friend? Oh, you're serious enough. But you're doing it all for the sake of your own private satisfaction. What I mean is, it's not real. There you are wrong, my friend. It is intensely real. But the old lady died of natural causes. I have yet to be convinced of that, Hastings. And somebody did attempt to kill her. You mean you're still determined to go on with it? Most certainly. Tomorrow we shall call on Miss Teresa Arundel. And who are we supposed to be this time? Oh, I shall present my card, Hastings. I shall go as myself. Monsieur Hercule Poirot! And to think I've lost my autograph book. You know my name, mademoiselle? Little friend of Scotland Yard. That's right, isn't it? Well, it is true that I do concern myself with problems of crime, mademoiselle. Why don't you take a seat, Monsieur Poirot? Thank you, mademoiselle. Allow me to introduce my good friend, Captain Hastings. How, how so what can I do for you, Monsieur Poirot? I was hoping, mademoiselle, that you might consent to answering a few questions. What about? Suppose you give me a specimen. Can you tell me the present address of your brother, Charles? I'm afraid I can't. I rather think he's left England. Is that all? Oh, no. We've got quite a few other questions. Such as? Are you satisfied with the way in which your Aunt Emily disposed of her fortune? <laughs> Ça ne vous regarde pas, Monsieur Poirot. Oh, does it not, Mademoiselle? You should not always judge a book by its jacket. Allow me to congratulate you on your French accent and to wish you a very good morning. Come, Hastings. Oh. Come back! Uh, oh, please, uh, please come back, Monsieur Poirot, and sit down. You too, Captain Hastings. Now, uh, let's stop playing the fool. It's just possible you may be useful to me. Possibly, Mademoiselle. <clears throat> In what way? Tell me how I can break that will. But surely what you need is a lawyer. The only lawyers I know are all respectable men. I want someone who is utterly unscrupulous, and I'm prepared to pay. And you believe that I am prepared to be unscrupulous if I am paid? You're a clever man. You could think up something. Like kidnapping the Lawson woman and frightening her into saying she forced Aunt Emily to change her will. Oh, your fertile imagination takes my breath away. <laughs> well, if that's a righteous refusal... No. It is not a righteous refusal, yet. But Poirot... Uh... Contain, I beg you, your beautiful and upright nature, Hastings. What we are about to do will be strictly within the law. My reputation, it must not suffer. But you have to give me all the facts of the case, mademoiselle. What do you want to know? What were the provisions of your aunt's original will? Everything was to be divided equally between Bella, Charles and me. And you knew about this? Aunt Emily made no secret of it. If any of us asked for a loan, she would say, You will have all my money when I am dead and gone. Be content with what you've got. And what does that amount to, mademoiselle? My father left Charles and me 30,000 each. The interest on that amounts to 1,200 a year. A nice little investment on which one can manage very prettily. But I do not wish to manage prettily. I want the best clothes and the best food. I want to go to the Mediterranean and lie in the summer sun. I want everything that's going in this rotten world, and I want it now. And how much of your 30,000 is left? 221 pounds, 14 and sevenpence. <laughs> so you see, you've got to get results. Oh, there will certainly be results. And what about your brother Charles? 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 Who's asking about Charles? What's going on, old girl? <laughs> this is Monsieur Poirot, Charles. He's going to do a little dirty work for us. Oh, mademoiselle, no, not dirty work. Shall we say a little harmless deception? <laughs> so that your aunt's original intentions can be carried out? May I present my good friend, Captain Hastings? Uh, how do you do, Mr. Arnold? How do you do, Captain? I always thought you, Monsieur Poirot, were famous for tracking down criminals. What do you have in mind? 
A little spot of forgery, perhaps. Mm. I got sent down from Oxford for a little misunderstanding about a check. And there was another little frisson with Aunt Emily about my doing a very passable imitation of her signature. But forging a deathbed will would be rather a different matter. By whom was your aunt's second will witnessed? Her solicitor, Purvis, brought down his clerk. And the other witness was the gardener. Purvis didn't care for the new will. He actually tried to talk Aunt Emily out of it. I shall need as much information as you can give me on the last weeks of your aunt's life. I believe you both stayed there for Easter. Yes. Tanius and Bella were there as well. Did anything of significance happen that we can't? I don't think so. What an appallingly self-centred creature you are, Teresa. You can't have forgotten that our revered aunt tripped over the dog's oh. ball and did a header down the staircase. Nearly finished her off. It might have been better if it had, really. Saved us all this fuss. Mm, it must have been a great disappointment to you. Well, it was, rather. Tough nuts, these old ladies. And when did you leave? On the Wednesday morning. And when did you next see your aunt? It wasn't the next weekend. It was the one after that. It was rather on the spur of the moment. Oh, tell him the truth, Charles. Bella and her husband had been down the weekend before. We were worried they might steal a march on us. It's a pretty story, isn't it? All of us with our tongues hanging out for the money. Was that really the case with your cousin and her husband? Oh, yes. Bella's always hard up. Rather pathetic the way she tries to copy all my clothes at about one-eighth of the price. Tanios speculated with her money, of course. She's a rather dreary woman, isn't she, Charles? Rather like an earwig. She's a devoted mother, of course. But so are earwigs, I believe. <laughs> And was anything said about the new will during that second weekend? No, nothing. Oh, yes, there was. But Charles... Surely, you remember, Aunt Emily made a kind of speech about it, said we weren't fit persons to be trusted with money. She hadn't actually got anything against Bella, but she didn't trust Tanios. She said she was convinced that if she left Bella anything, he'd try to get his hands on it. Therefore, she was going to leave everything to Miss Lawson. The woman's a fool, she said, but I really believe she is devoted to me. She told me she thought it only fair to let me know so I wouldn't try to raise money against my expectations. Rather a nasty one, that, since it was exactly what I was planning to do. And what did you say to all that? Oh, I just laughed. I told her it was a bit of a blow, but it was her own money to do with what she liked. She said I was quite a sportsman and actually gave me a fiver. As a matter of fact, I didn't take it very seriously. I thought she'd tear the will up after a few weeks. I believe she would have done if she hadn't died so suddenly. Could anyone, um, Miss Lawson, for instance, have overheard that conversation? We weren't speaking any too low. And she was hovering about the door when I went out. And you knew nothing of this, Miss Arundel? Well, I I'm sure I told you, Teresa, or, or at least hinted at it. If you had told me, Charles, I don't think I would have forgotten. Do you, Monsieur Poirot? No, mademoiselle, I do not think you would have forgotten. But, Monsieur Arundel, let me be clear on one point. Did your aunt tell you she was about to alter her will, or that she had altered it? Oh, she'd already changed it. As a matter of fact, she showed me the new will. She actually showed it to you? Oh, yes. You would swear to that? Well, certainly. And you, mademoiselle, did your aunt say anything of importance to you during that weekend? Oh, she lectured me on my way of life. Too many clothes, too many parties, too many men. But then she always did. Ah, uh, now I must be on my way. Um, tell me, is Miss Lawson the kind of person who might conceivably lose her head under cross-examination in court? I should say that a really bullying KC could make her say that black was white. Why don't you go and see her for yourself? She lives in some dreary flat in Bayswater, Clan Royden Mansions. We shall go straight away. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Au revoir, monsieur Arundel. Come, Hastings. But Poirot did not leave the flat. In the hall, he opened and shut the front door, put his fingers to his lips, then tiptoed back to the door of Miss Arundel's sitting room and, quite unblushingly, put his ear to the crack. No, oh, you... Fool, Charles, you fool! I don't care for that sort of thing, Poirot. Do we have to listen at doors? But it was not you who applied your ear to the crack. 
used to their bolt upright like a soldier. But I heard just the same. Well, Mademoiselle was hardly whispering. But come, there is work to be done. Let us take a look at Wilhelmina Lawson. She is, after all, the only person to have benefited from the death of Emily Arundel, and by a very considerable amount. Oh, please do take a seat. I'm afraid there isn't much room. Thank you. Yes, do move that table if it's in your way. Oh, these flats are a teeny bit on the small side, but so central. Now, what I have to say to you, Miss Lawson is in the strictest confidence. Oh, yes, of course. You may not be aware that shortly before she died, Miss Emily Arundel wrote to me. Monsieur Poirot is a well-known private detective. I see. Was it about the money? The money? You mean, um... Uh, the money that was... Um... Yes, uh, the money that was taken from the drawer. Ah. Did Miss Arundel tell you she had written to me? No, I had no idea, and... Very surprised that she... That she should have mentioned it to anyone. Yes, she had a very good idea. A very good idea of who took it? And I shouldn't have thought she would have wanted... Was it a family matter, Miss Lawson? Yes, it was. I specialise in family matters. I am very discreet. Very? Of course, there had been trouble with Charles before. Once, I believe, he had to go to Australia. Now... I understand that Miss Arundel left a sum of money in a drawer. Yes, for the wages and so on. And how much was missing exactly? Four pounds. No, I'm wrong. Three pound notes and two ten shilling ones. Was there anything to show who'd taken the money? Oh, but it could only have been Charles. I don't think Miss Teresa would do such a thing. Nor would Mrs Tanios. And her husband wouldn't have known where the money was kept. And neither of the maids would have dreamed of doing such a thing. Miss Lawson, I wonder if you could give me any idea, I'm sure you can, for if anyone possessed Miss Arundel's confidence, you did. Oh, I I don't know about that, I'm sure. Have you any idea of the reason why Miss Arundel changed her will? Her will? It is true, is it not, that she made a new will shortly before her death, leaving all her fortune to you? Yes, but I knew nothing about it. Nothing at all. It was the greatest surprise to me. It was like a... like a fairy story. But sometimes I don't feel altogether comfortable about it. Because of Miss Arundel leaving all her money away from the family? I mean, it doesn't seem right, does it? You mean you would prefer to relinquish the money? Well, of course, there are two sides to every question. Obviously, Miss Arundel meant me to have the money... If I didn't take it, I should be going against her wishes. But I have worried about it a great deal. Bella is such a nice woman and those sweet children. Uh, Perhaps Miss Arundel meant me to use my discretion. She didn't want to leave any money directly because she was afraid that man would get hold of it. What man? Husband. Poor Bella does everything he tells her. I dare say she'd murder someone if he told her to. Hmm. What kind of man is Dr Tanios? Well, he's a very pleasant sort of man. But you don't quite trust him. I don't know that I trust any man very much. Such dreadful things one hears, and all the things their poor wives have to go through. Oh, he pretends to be very fond of Bella, and he's very charming to her. But I don't trust foreigners. They're so artful. But it is hard for Miss Teresa and Mr Charles also to be deprived of their inheritance. I think Teresa has quite as much money as is good for her. She spends hundreds of pounds on her clothes. And as for her underwear, it's wicked. You think it would do her no harm to earn her own living? It might do her a lot of good. Bring her to her senses. And Charles Arundel? He doesn't deserve a penny. His aunt cut him off for a very good reason. And after his wicked threats. You mean he actually threatened her? It was on the Easter Sunday which made it even worse. He asked her for some money and she refused to give it to him. And he told her if she kept up that attitude, he'd bump her off. Bump her off? What did she say to that? She said, I think you'll find, Charles, that I can look after myself. You were in the room at the time? Not actually in the room, no. No, no. You knew, of course, that Miss Arundel was making a new will. Well, I suspected something of the kind when she sent for her lawyer while she was laid up. That was after her fall? Yes. Bob, that was her dog, 
had left his ball at the top of the stairs and she tripped over it and fell. She might easily have been killed. That's what the doctor said. We made Bob's acquaintance when we called her Little Greenhouse. <laughs> Splendid little chap. Oh, yes, he's a nice little doggy. <laughs> Do you think it possible that her fall influenced her to change her will? I shouldn't wonder if you weren't right. It gave her a shock. She might even have had a premonition that her death wasn't far off. Her illness must have come on very suddenly. Oh, yes, it did. It was all very strange. We had Isabella and Julia trip round that evening. The spiritualist ladies. Was Miss Arundel a believer? She was very sceptical. But on that occasion, there was the most extraordinary manifestation. You know what ectoplasm is? Mm, I am acquainted with its nature. Well, that evening we saw a luminous ribbon issuing out of Miss Arundel's mouth. Good Lord. Then her head became enveloped in a kind of mist. We were certain it was a sign she was about to pass over into the other sphere. And she was taken ill that very night, and we had to give up the seance. Now, Teresa and Charles Arundel had been down that weekend, had they not? They had. The visit was not a success, perhaps. It was not. Miss Arundel knew what they'd come for. Money. Hmm. And they didn't get it? They did not. And I believe that's what Dr. Tanios was after, too. Was he down here that same weekend? Yes, he came down on the Sunday. He only stayed about an hour. Well... Thank you very much, Miss Rawson, for all your kindness and help. Oh, I'm very glad if I've been of use. I think there is something you should be told. Charles and Teresa Arundel are hoping to upset the will. They can't do that. My lawyer says so. Oh, you have already consulted a lawyer, then? Certainly. Why shouldn't I? I knew the family wouldn't give up that easily. Hastings, that woman is either exactly what she seems to be or else she is a very clever actress. I wish I could be sure. Well, she obviously doesn't think Miss Arundel died anything other than a perfectly natural death. So it would appear, yes. Are you sure you're not just being carried away by professional zeal? You want it to be murder, so it must be murder. But murder is my business, Hastings. I am like a great specialist who knows all there is to know about a particular part of the body, and I have never yet given an inaccurate diagnosis. Uh, so, where do we go next? I think perhaps we should pay a call on Mrs. Tanyos and her husband. After all, did Miss Lawson not say the lady would kill anyone if he told her to do so? Taxi! But why, exactly, have you come to see me, Monsieur Poirot? I have been talking to your cousins Charles and Teresa Arundel, Mrs. Tanyos, and I want to know whether you would be prepared to join them in taking action against Miss Lawson. But surely that's not possible, is it? My husband consulted a firm of lawyers, I believe, who advised against it. I should have to talk to him. Ah, but what are your own feelings in the matter? Well, I really don't know. It depends so much on my husband. He's out at the moment taking the children for a walk. Yes, yeah, but you yourself. What do you think, madame? I don't think I like the idea very much. If Aunt Emily chose to leave her money away from the family, I suppose we must put up with it. Is it possible she may have been unduly influenced by Miss Lawson? I don't see Aunt Emily being influenced by anybody, particularly by Miss Lawson, who was, well, nothing very much. That's why I think to go to law might be rather undignified and spiteful. Perhaps I should tell you that I am a detective. Oh? And shortly before she died, Emily Arundel wrote me a letter. A letter? About my husband? Ah, I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to answer that question. Then it was about my husband. I can assure you that whatever it was, it would have been entirely untrue. Obviously, Charles and Teresa must have said something to her about him. And Aunt Emily was prejudiced because he was not an Englishman. When did you last see Emily Arundel? Must have been about ten days before she died. Was that the time you were there with your cousins, Mrs. Tanius? No, that was the weekend before, at Easter. So, you and Dr. Tanius were there the weekend after Easter as well? Yes, we were. Did she say anything to you about having changed her will? No, nothing. And her attitude towards you was just the same as usual? Yes, it was. 
And as regards your husband, was there any alteration in her manner towards him? Well, yes. She was suddenly more distant, and she behaved rather oddly. There was a special digestive mixture he recommended. He even went to the chemist to get it made up. And I actually saw Aunt Emily pouring it away down the sink. Well, that was a bit odd. I thought it most ungrateful. Oh, that must be my husband. Did you have a good walk, darling? This morning we did not have a walk. I took them on the omnibus for the first time in their lives. I must say my first sight of Dr Tanios was rather a shock. I had been picturing to myself a swarthy, rather sinister foreigner, but he was comfortably rotund with a neat little brown beard and full of cheerful good humour. He spoke English perfectly. Poirot? Monsieur Hercule Poirot? But I know the name well. Needless to say, Mrs Tanniels didn't bother to introduce her husband to me. It's about the will, Jacob. Monsieur Poirot has been conferring with Teresa and Charles. An iniquitous document. I'm certain that will was made when the old lady was not responsible for what she was doing. That Lawson woman is clever and cunning. But perhaps you do not agree, madame. Miss Lawson has always been very kind, and I wouldn't call her clever. She's been kind to you because she has nothing to fear from you, Bella. But with me it was different. I'll give you an instance, gentlemen. Bella's aunt had a fall down the stairs when we were staying there. I insisted on coming back the following weekend to see how she was. Miss Lawson did her utmost to prevent me going to her room. It was clear she wanted Miss Arundel to herself. You were also at Market Basing, I think, the weekend before Miss Arundel's death. Quite right. We were there at Easter and the weekend after that. No, no, no. I mean the following weekend. You were there on the Sunday, I think, Dr. Tanyos. Were you, Jacob? Well, you can't have forgotten. I drove down in the afternoon. I told you all about it. Of course. I remember now. Teresa and Charles Arundel were there also, I believe. They may have been. I didn't see them. You did not stay long then? Not more than half an hour. Uh, I may as well tell you I was hoping to get alone. But I'm afraid the old lady didn't take to the idea. May I ask you a question, Dr. Tenuous? Certainly, Monsieur Poirot. What is your opinion of Charles and Teresa Arundel? To be perfectly frank with you, I think they're rotten to the core. Charles can't help it. He's a likeable rogue with no moral sense, but Teresa is quite ruthless. She'd kill anyone who stood in her way. It's in her blood. You may have heard that her mother was tried for murder. And acquitted. As you say. But it makes you wonder sometimes. Mm-hmm. And now you must excuse us, Captain Hastings, and I have another appointment. Thank you both. You have been most amiable. We delayed for a moment or two in the hall of the hotel. Poirot went into the telephone booth and I waited for him by the porter's desk. Captain Hastings, your friend, Monsieur Poirot, has he gone? He's making a telephone call. Do you want to speak to him? Yes, I... Uh... Ah, Madame Tanyos. Were you looking for me? Monsieur Poirot, there is something I must tell you. Yes, madame. You see, my husband... Having a last word with Monsieur Poirot, Bella? Yes, I just want you to tell Teresa, Monsieur Poirot, that I will back her up in anything she decides to do. I quite see that the family must stand together. Goodbye. You know, Poirot, that wasn't what she started to say at all. She changed her mind the moment her husband appeared. Why? Ah, I wish I knew. That woman has something on her mind. She obviously knows something. Oh, you have changed, my friend. You are no longer cynically amused, indulging me in my investigation. What has suddenly made you take this matter seriously? Mrs. Tanios looked afraid. Yes, you are quite right. But why? Am I disturbing the sleeping dogs? Am I prompting the murderer to strike again? So, what do we do now? We return to market basing. But first, we must call at my apartment. There should be a letter from Teresa Arundel. That was why I telephoned. A letter of introduction to Emily Arundel's solicitor. The letter was there, awaiting us, as was Charles Arundel, who had brought it. I had the distinct impression he had been snooping around. Well, I hope you had better luck with old Purvis than we did. 
In his opinion, the Lawson woman was legally entitled to every penny, and there wasn't a thing we could do about it. Have you and your sister never considered an appeal to the lady's finer feelings? I did consider it, but for some unaccountable reason, Miss Lawson didn't seem to care for me. Is it true that you threatened your aunt about her will, told her that you'd bump her off? Now, how did you find that out? No matter. Is it true? Well, yes, I suppose. I'd been attempting a touch. Aunt Emily was not enthusiastic about being parted from her money, and I told her if she went on like that, she'd end up by getting bumped off. Thank you, Charles, she said, but I think you'll find I'm well able to look after myself. And so you contented yourself with a few pounds you found in a drawer. I really do take my hat off to you, Monsieur Poirot. Mm -hmm. How did you get hold of that extraordinary piece of information? Miss Lawson told us. The sly old pussycat. And I suppose she told you about the conversation with Aunt Emily. But I wouldn't really have put strychnine in, in the old dear's soup. And so, once again, we took the road to Market Basing, stopping off for Poirot to have a word with Mr Purvis. The new will had come as a complete surprise to him. He had even tried to advise Miss Arundel against it. We put up at the George again for the night, where the asthmatic waiter served us a thoroughly bad dinner. Poirot was terribly tiresome about the soup. But it is so easy to make a good soup. Let me explain, Hastings. <laughs> When we visited Little Green House the following morning, Bob was absolutely overjoyed to see me and insisted on taking me off for a tour of the garden. Leaving me free to have a quiet word with Ellen about Miss Arundel's collection of medicines. The old lady seemed to have been particularly attached to some totally useless patent liver capsules. I say, Poirot, I've just been having a word with the gardener and he says his tin of weed killer is practically empty. And what does that signify, my friend? Well, apparently Charles Arundel was always hanging around the garden shed when he was down here. He even wanted to know what kind of weed killer the gardener used. And what was it? Arsenic. And do you remember the way Charles did a kind of hesitation before he said strychnine? Obviously, he wanted to avoid saying arsenic. Do you think that's what killed the old lady? Unfortunately, Hastings, all her symptoms were those of the liver disease from which she was suffering. Yeah, but her death can't possibly have been natural. She must have been poisoned. <laughs> it seemed that Hastings and I had changed places. I went into the chemist's shop and bought a packet of the patent liver pills to which Emily Arundel had been so attached. A very good preparation, sir. You'll find them most efficacious. Miss Arundel used to take them, I believe. Indeed she did, sir. A fine lady, one of the old school. Did she take many patent medicines? Not as many as her companion, Miss Lawson. All kinds of pills and lozenges she had. Dyspepsia tablets, digestive mixtures... Did Miss Arundel take her liver capsules regularly? Oh, yes. She'd been having them for three months before she died. Now, a relation of hers, a Dr. Tanyos, came in to have a mixture made up here, I believe. Yes, the foreign gentleman that married Miss Arundel's niece. A very interesting combination of drugs, it was. Did his wife come in here at all? Only once. She wanted a sleeping draught. Chloral it was. I remember it because the prescription was for a double quantity. Doctors don't usually prescribe so much at a time. Whose prescription was it? Oh, Dr. Tanyos had signed it. It was quite in order, but we always have to be careful because if a doctor makes a mistake and we make up the prescription, we're the ones who get the blame. While we were having breakfast the following morning, a note arrived by hand. It is from Miss Lawson. She wishes us to call on her at Little Green House. What's she doing down here? I didn't mean to put you to any trouble, Monsieur Poirot. But when I arrived yesterday evening, Ellen told me of your visit and I wondered... You wondered what I was doing down here? Yes, that's exactly it. I must make a confession to you, Mademoiselle. You assumed that the letter I received from Miss Arundel concerned itself with the stolen money. But that was not the case. Then what was it about? It was about her accident. Her accident? We understand she fell downstairs. But why should that concern you? Monsieur Poirot is sometimes concerned with accidental deaths. Uh, but I still don't understand. 
The cause of the accident was supposed to be Bob's ball. There's no supposed about it. I saw it there myself. You saw it, yes, perhaps, but it was not the cause of the accident. The cause of the accident, Miss Lawson, was a dark-coloured thread stretched about a foot above the top of the stairs. But I can't... I, I can't believe it. You, you mean somebody did it on purpose? Oh, yes. And if that somebody had succeeded, it would have been murder. How horrible. A nail was hammered into the skirting board so that the thread could be attached to it, and it was varnished so as not to show. Oh, my Lord. Of course. You mean it really happened? What was it, mademoiselle? Did you see something? I thought I must have imagined it. Tell us, Miss Lawson. It was on the night of the Easter Bank holiday. I was lying awake. It had been such a trying day. There had barely been enough cold beef to go round at supper. And I was just starting to drop off when I heard a sort of tapping noise from outside my room. And I sat up in bed. And I saw her in the glass. Saw whom? I always keep my door a little open at night so I can see the top of the stairs in my wardrobe mirror just in case Miss Arundel were to go down in the night. And what did you see, Miss Lawson? She was kneeling on the third stair from the top with her head down. I thought she must have slipped or dropped something and then she got up and went away. But who was it? It was Teresa. You are sure of that? It was dark. And you could only see her reflection in the mirror. There was a light on in the far corner of the landing. But how could you be so sure it was Teresa Arundel? She was in that dark green dressing gown with the big shining brooch she wears. It has her initials on it. I saw it quite plainly. You saw her initials? Yes, the brooch is in the form of a big T-A. She often wears it. I could swear to it being Teresa... And I will swear to it in court, if necessary. Depeche on nous, Hastings. We must return to London at once. Do you really believe it was Teresa she saw in the glass? Oh, she seemed completely certain, although... Yes, but... Uh, did it strike you there was something that was wrong in what she said? Wrong? In what way? Ah, that is just it. I do not know. Something... something that was impossible... But let us waste no time. Mm. Teresa Arundel may have some perfectly plausible reason for being on the stairs that night, but there can be no doubt that she is a woman who would not hesitate to commit murder if it served her purpose. But when we arrived at Poirot's apartment, his manservant George told us that Dr Tanius was waiting in the study and that a lady had called that morning in a state of great distress and had gone away again. It can only have been Mrs Tanius. Now why could she not have waited? But do not let Dr. Tanyas know of this. We are dealing with a very delicate situation here, my friend. You must forgive me for forcing my way in like this. Oh, pardon you too. Please sit down, Doctor. I have come because I am worried, terribly worried, about my wife. I'm very sorry to hear that. I thought perhaps you might have seen her. Not since we left her at the hotel with you yesterday. I thought perhaps she might have called upon you, Monsieur Poirot. Well, we've been out of town all day. I am afraid she is on the verge of a complete nervous breakdown. She is suffering from some form of persecution mania, and it occurred to me that she might have come to you with some extraordinary tale or other. She may conceivably believe she is in danger from me. But why should she come to me, Doctor? You are a celebrated detective. I could see my wife was very impressed at meeting you. She might have come to you with all sorts of unlikely tales. And you've no idea where she's got to? She left the hotel early this morning while I was out, taking the children with her. If she should come here, I would be obliged if you would let me know at once. Of course. You have my deepest sympathy. Goodbye, then. Uh, by the way, Doctor. Yes, Monsieur Poirot? Do you ever prescribe chloral for your wife? I may have done in the past, but not lately. She seems to have taken an aversion to any form of sleeping draught. In her present mental condition, she is probably suspicious of anything you offer her to eat or drink. I fear that may be so. Well, do not let me detain you any longer. You may find your wife waiting for you when you return. But when Poirot telephoned the hotel a few minutes later, he was told that Mrs Tanyos had sent a taxi for all her luggage, but had left no forwarding address. I will leave instructions with George that if Mrs. Tanyos returns, he must try and persuade her to remain here. 
but on no account to let Dr. Tenyos in. And now we had better hear what Miss Teresa Arundel has to say for herself. Oh, I have the faintest idea what she's talking about. She must be loopy. So why were you kneeling on the stairs, Mademoiselle? I wasn't kneeling on the stairs. I never came out of my room after I went to bed on any night I was staying there. But Miss Lawson says she recognised you. Then she's a liar. She recognised your dressing gown and the brooch you were wearing. Do I look like the kind of frump who'd wear a brooch on her dressing gown? What brooch was it anyway? A brooch with your initials on it. Oh, I know the one. Do you have the brooch here with you now, mademoiselle? I haven't worn it for ages. She'll be here somewhere. They're selling them all over London now. Every little skivvy has one. Was it expensive? I don't wear cheap jewellery. They were quite exclusive to begin with. Here you are. Hmm. It is certainly very distinctive. And the TA is quite unmistakable. Mm. Could you hold the brooch against your dress and stand by the mirror? If you wish. Like this? Thank you, mademoiselle. And now, if that's all, I'd like you to go. Um, there is a possibility that the body of your aunt may be exhumed. Is this your doing? It can't happen without the permission of the family. On the contrary. It can be done on an order from the Home Office. But there are ways of avoiding such a contingency. Then avoid it. Avoid it at all costs. Do anything you can to stop it. And now get out of here. And take St. Leonard's with you. <laughs> Poirot seemed inordinately amused by what I considered a particularly stupid joke. Like, what's so funny about St. Leonard's being next to Hastings? Ah, Miss Hedrosa. St. Leonard. <laughs> the following morning, I came down to find him at his writing table, scribbling busily away. Um, a little moment, mon ami. It is nearly finished. There. Could you kindly pass me that envelope? What have you been writing? An account of the case to be placed in safekeeping in case somebody bumps you off? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, Hastings, you are not far from the truth. Is our murderer about to get dangerous? A murderer is always dangerous. Any news of Mrs. Tanyos? Her husband telephoned early this morning to say he has been unable to trace her anywhere. And now we must be going. Where to? To the apartment of Miss Lawson in Kleinroyden Mansions. She returned there yesterday evening. What are you going to say to her? That, mon ami, you will hear in due course. More lies, I suppose? Oh, you really can be quite offensive sometimes, Hastings. Anybody would think I enjoyed telling lies. <laughs> I rather think you do. In fact, I'm sure of it. Well, hmm. it is true I sometimes congratulate myself on my ingenuity. Come. Oh, thank goodness it's you. Bella's here. She turned up half an hour ago with the children. Completely exhausted, poor soul. Really, I don't know what to do about it. Does her husband know she's here? Gracious, no. And she says nothing will ever induce her to go back to him. She has confided in you? Well, not really. She won't say anything very much. She spent last night in a little hotel near Paddington. But she can't stay here. This flat's much too small for her well, and the children. Well, couldn't you send her to Market Basin? Oh, I suppose I could. But her husband might think of that. I've got her rooms at the Wellington Hotel in Queen's Road under the name of Mrs Peters. I would like to see her. She called at my apartment yesterday morning, but I was out. I didn't know that. I'll tell her you're here. If you would be so kind. Bella, my dear, Monsieur Poirot is here. Will you come and see him? Yes, of course. Monsieur Poirot, I wanted to talk to you. Yes, madame. No, I, I daren't. He's sure to find out. Who will find out? My husband. He came to see me yesterday. What did he say? Did he tell you I was mad? Well, he said you were in a highly nervous state. He wants to shut me up, so I won't be able to tell anyone, ever. To tell anyone what? How do I know I can trust you? You might be on his side. I am on no one's side, madame. I am on the side only of truth. What did he say about me? Did he say I had delusions? Yes, madame. 
To be frank, he did. You see? That's what it will sound like. And I have no proof. No real proof. Do you suspect your husband of killing Emily Arundel? I don't suspect. I know. How did he kill her? I don't know exactly, but he did kill her. It was on that last Sunday. The Sunday he went down there by himself? Yes. But you don't know what he did? No. Then how can you be sure? I I can't tell you. I, I simply can't. <gasps> That'll be him. I know it. Don't tell him I'm here, Miss Lawson. Don't tell him. Uh, 4351, Miss Lawson speaking. Oh, hello, Dr. Tanius. Oh, what did I tell you? No, I've heard nothing, I'm afraid. I thought she must be with you. Have you thought of bringing Teresa? I think it would be unwise for Mrs. Tanyos to remain here any longer. Yes. The Wellington Hotel is just round the corner. Poirot, if you go there with Mrs. Tanyos now, I'll follow on with the children and the luggage as soon as the coast is clear. Excellent, Goodbye, Hastings. Mrs. Tanyos and I will leave straight away. My heart's pounding. I feel quite sick. Do you think he could have seen us? Do not agitate yourself, madame. He is still at your hotel, waiting for news of you. Now... You must listen to me very carefully. I can't tell you any more. I can't. I've said too much already. I want you to tell me nothing. Suppose that I already know all the facts of the case. Suppose that everything you could tell me I have already guessed. I don't know what you mean. I know the truth, madame. This envelope contains all the facts of the case. After you have read this, telephone me at my apartment and tell me if I am right. Very well. I will do what you say. And now you must leave this hotel at once. Why must I do that? You must go to the Coniston Hotel near Euston Station. You will find a room booked in your name. Tell no one that you are going. But surely your husband, still... madame, is a very clever man. He would not find it difficult to talk a foolish woman like Miss Lawson into giving him the address of this hotel. Leave here with the children as soon as possible. It is the children you must think of. You love them very much, do you not? Yes, monsieur. I love them. And I believe I understand what you are saying. Poirot and I sat in a cafe across the road from the hotel. After about ten minutes, we saw Mrs. Tanyos and the children get into a taxi and drive away. So, we have done our part. Now it is upon the knees of the gods... Echo Poirot's apartment. Captain Hastings speaking. This is Mrs. Tanios. Oh. Will you tell Monsieur Poirot that he is perfectly right and ask him to call at my hotel tomorrow morning at ten o'clock? At ten tomorrow. I'll tell him, Mrs. Tanios. Thank you. Goodbye. At ten o'clock? Yes. Good. All much is well. Oh, I must admit I'm rather fogged. Whom exactly do we suspect? I really could not say whom you suspect, Hastings. Everyone in turn, I should imagine. You know, sometimes I think it amuses you to get me in this state. Oh, forgive me, mon ami. I am always nervous towards the end of a case. Nervous that something might go wrong. Is anything likely to go wrong? No, I do not think so. <laughs> I believe I have provided against every contingency... Then let's go out, take in a show, have a good dinner and see what tomorrow may bring. Oh, oh, Monsieur Poirot, such a terrible thing has happened. What tomorrow did bring was Miss Lawson, who somehow evaded the ever-vigilant George and rushed into the apartment just as I was opening my letters. It's Bella. She left the Wellington without a word to me. I went there late in the afternoon and they told me she'd gone. It makes me feel that perhaps Dr. Tanios was right after all. Perhaps she was suffering from some kind of persecution mania. But is that all, Miss, Miss Lawson? <laughs> that, that she left the hotel without telling you? Oh, no. If that were all, it would be quite all right. Then what's happened? She's dead. Dead? She died in her sleep. An overdose of something. Oh. Chloral, I think they said it was. How did you get to hear about it, Miss Lawson? Who told you? They rang from the hotel. The Coniston, I think it's called. It seems my name and address was in her bag. Are you sure it was an accident? They didn't think it might be suicide. Oh, what a terrible idea, Captain Hastings. 
Of course, she did seem very distressed, but she didn't need to have been. I mean, there wouldn't have been any difficulty about money. I was going to share it with her. I thought she understood that. It seems too awful to think of her taking her own life. Thank goodness those poor children weren't there to see it. They weren't there? No. Somebody came for them late in the afternoon. He brought a letter. Mrs. Tanyos came down with them to see them into the taxi. Uh, This person who came for them, it wasn't Tanyos? Oh, no. He didn't have a beard. That was the first thing I asked. They said he was a military-looking man. A military-looking man? Thank you for coming to tell us, Miss Orson. It must have been very distressing for you. Oh, is there anything I should do? No, no, no. You can leave it all to me. I should like you to go down to Little Greenhouse. The rest of the family will join you there tomorrow, as will Captain Hastings and myself. Oh, very well, monsieur. Oh, to think of poor Bella dying all alone. Goodbye. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Goodbye, Miss Lawson. Oh. Mm-hmm. oh. Is that what you feared last night, Poirot? when you said you were always nervous towards the end of a case. I feared another death, yes. You don't think it was an accident? No, Hastings, it was no accident. So, who was this person who came to take the children? Clearly it was someone in whom Mrs. Tanyos had confidence. Or rather, it was someone sent by a third party in whom Mrs. Tanyos had confidence. The real agent kept himself in the background. And the letter came from this person? Yes. And what happened to this letter? Mrs. Tanyos would have been instructed to burn it. But what about your resume of the case? That too will have been burned. But it is all in the little grey cells of Hercule Poirot. I will reveal everything tomorrow when we join the rest of the family at Little Green House. Six people assembled in the drawing room of Little Green House. Hercule Poirot, standing by the mantelpiece. Charles and Teresa on the sofa. Dr Tanyos, with a black band round his arm, sat in a grandfather chair. Miss Lawson, red-eyed, was perched on a stool directly facing Poirot. I knew that one of these people must be the murderer. But which... We are here to inquire into the death of Emily Arundel on the 1st of May. There are four possibilities. That she died naturally, that her death was the result of an accident, that she took her own life, or that she was murdered. No inquest was held at the time of her death, since it was assumed that she had died of natural causes. And although there was sufficient suspicion to justify an exhumation, I did not advocate it for the simple reason that my client would not have wished it. Uh, So who is your client, Monsieur Poirot? My client is Emily Arundel, and her particular desire was that there should be no scandal. I knew I should never have let myself be taken in by that silly story about contesting a will. Miss Arundel wrote to me in considerable distress of mind after she had her fall, a fall supposedly caused by her dog's ball, but she herself knew it was no accident. Somebody had tried to kill her. She was certain that the attempt could only have been made by one of the members of her family staying in the house at the time, and she was not going to let it happen again. And so she took two steps. She wrote to me, and she changed her will, partly, I believe, out of spite towards her family, and more importantly, to protect herself. But how could she protect herself by changing her will? Because she had a very definite suspicion of one member of the family, and she was concerned for the honour of the Arundels. She was certain that person was an Arundel and a man. Well, that doesn't leave much room for doubt, does it? And Charles had come close to disgracing the family honour before. A little matter of forging her name on a cheque. She never forgave me for that. Only two days before the accident happened, he had asked her for money and had been refused. And I told her she was going the right way to getting herself bumped off. Yes, we've been through all that. It was a joke, for heaven's sake. And was it a joke to take weed killer from the gardener's shed? How did you find that out? But I'd never have gone through with it. I haven't the nerve. No, I believe you, Mr. Arundel. It is not your way. 
Nevertheless, your aunt sent for her solicitor, Mr. Purvis, and made a new will. She told me what she'd done. She even showed it to me. Why didn't you tell me? Well, to, to be perfectly honest, I felt a tiny bit guilty. It was entirely due to me she'd changed her will and done you out of a very handsome inheritance. <laughs> Only one person stood to benefit from the new will, and if Miss Lawson had herself staged the so-called accident... I did nothing of the kind! It's quite outrageous uh, 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 to me. A little patience, mademoiselle. I was saying that if Miss Lawson had staged the accident, it would have been a way of making sure that Miss Arundel disinherited her close family. But I did not stage the accident! <laughs> oh, you naughty doggy! How did you get in here? Ellen! <laughs> Ellen! Uh, it's all right, Oh, Lovely to get excited about. Thank you, boy. There you are, Ellen. Have a game later, old I am sorry for the interruption, Monsieur Poirot. I did give strict instructions. But Master Bob's intervention was timed to perfection. For we must return to the little matter of his ball. Everyone assumed that he was responsible for the accident, but you knew, Miss Lawson, that he could not have left his ball on the stairs because he had been out of the house all night. If you had revealed that fact, it would have confirmed Miss Arundel's suspicions about her family, but you chose to keep silent. I was certain one of her close relatives must have been responsible, but I didn't want her to know. I wanted to spare her feelings. So how did the old lady come to fall down the stairs? A trip wire had been stretched across the top of the stairs. Let and... us pass on to the second attempt on Miss Arundel's life an attempt which most unfortunately succeeded. At first, everything seemed to confirm Dr. Granger's conclusion that there was nothing unnatural about her death. But then, I learned a more significant fact. On the evening Miss Arundel was taken ill, Isabel and Julia Tripp had come round after dinner. Oh, well, they're barking mad. What have they got to do with it? Miss Arundel was persuaded by them to take part in a séance, and they told me, that a halo of light had appeared round her head. Oh, come on, Monsieur Poirot. Surely you're not going to be taken in no, by a... I saw it. It was like a luminous ribbon coming out of her mouth. What it actually amounted to, as I am sure you will be aware, Dr. Ternios, was that on the night in question, Miss Arundel's breath was phosphorescent. Oh. And that could only mean that someone had administered phosphorus to her in some shape or form. But what was so diabolically clever was that diagnostically the effects of phosphorus poison would have exactly resembled another attack of the liver trouble from which Miss Arundel had suffered for years. So Dr. Granger wouldn't have noticed anything suspicious? Exactly. Now, phosphorus is not difficult to get hold of. A few foreign matches would have been sufficient for the murderer's purpose. And did your suspicions turn towards me, Monsieur Poirot? Yes, Dr. Tanyas. You had the motive and the opportunity. But the facts of phosphorus poisoning are not difficult to come by. Anyone could find them in a medical textbook. And I was convinced that the first murder attempt, the incident of the dog's bull, was essentially... A woman's idea. And you were quite right. I saw Teresa quite clearly kneeling on the staircase. It, it wasn't me. I would never have tried to harm Aunt Emily. Would you not, mademoiselle? You are desperate for money. You are cold and ruthless and not over-scrupulous. I may be all those things, Monsieur Poirot, but I could not kill a living, breathing human creature. I simply couldn't. I believe you, mademoiselle. And there was something fundamentally wrong in Miss Lawson's story about the figure she saw on the staircase. You're not suggesting I made the whole thing up. No, 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 not in the least, Miss Lawson. But the only reason you were able to identify the figure you saw kneeling on the staircase was by the brooch she was wearing. Yes, it had Teresa's initials on it. T.A. There was no doubt about it. Good Lord, I, I think I've got it. What is it that you have got, mon ami? Um, Miss Lawson said she saw the woman reflected in the mirror, so the initials 
would have been reversed. It wasn't T-A at all, but A-T. But who on earth is A-T? Well, at least that lets me out. How could I have been so stupid? It was Bella. She was named after her mother, Arabella. Poor Bella. She always copied my things. She must have seen me wearing mine and wanted one for herself. But I'd never have thought she was capable of... When did you begin to suspect my poor wife, Monsieur Poirot? From the moment I saw her. I realised at once she was afraid. And she saw I knew that. So she attempted to give a performance of a woman who was afraid for her husband. And then she changed tactics, playing the role of a woman who was afraid of her husband. (laughs) She did it very cleverly. But she could hardly be both. She never really loved me. I think she only married me because she did not want to be an old maid. And then there were the children. But you were devoted to her, were you not? Utterly. The only thing that illuminated her life was the expectation of the fortune she would inherit from her aunt. It would give her the independence she craved. It would have enabled her to take the children away from her. She was passionately attached to them and jealous of their affection for you. After a time, she grew impatient. She could not wait for her aunt to die, and she was desperate for her freedom. I suspect she had already planned the murder before you both returned to England from Smyrna. And then she must have seen Bob's game with the ball, and it gave her an idea. So much simpler than phosphorus poisoning. Her aunt fell headlong down the stairs, but survived. And so, quietly and determinedly... This unhappy, ambitious woman put her original plan into action. But how did she actually go about it? She could not have failed to notice the patent capsules that her aunt took before every meal. To open a capsule, insert the phosphorus, and close it up again was child's play. And when Aunt Emily did swallow the poison capsule, Bella would probably be miles away from market basing. So what happened when Bella discovered that she wasn't going to inherit all that lovely money after all? She set to work to make you feel guilty. Did she not, Miss Lawson? I've been so wicked. So very wicked. You see, I was curious to know what was in the new will Purvis had drawn up for Miss Arundel. So when she was sleeping, I unlocked the drawer of her desk took a look at it and discovered she'd left everything to you all the money that should rightfully have come to us I didn't know how much it was of course and then when she was so ill she asked to see the will I felt sure she was going to destroy it so I told her it had gone back to Mr Purvis she told me to get it from him at once but then she died and it was too late to do anything about it what a crafty little soul you are Miss Lawson and I always thought butter wouldn't melt in your mouth. I felt as if I'd embezzled the money. So when Bella came to see me, I told her she could have half of it. Do you see? Mrs. Tanyos was succeeding in her objective. Was that why Bella didn't want to contest the will? Because she hoped she might get all the money in the end? I believe so, mademoiselle. And I actually believed she wanted to respect Aunt Emily's wishes. At the same time, she was preparing to rid herself of her husband. She had in her possession a lethal dose of chloral, which she had obtained by forging your signature, Doctor. I was certain that her next step would be to take your life, and I had to make certain that she would kill no more. So I wrote out my construction of the case, telling her what I knew had happened, and gave it to her in an envelope. So that was why she killed herself? Was it not the best way? There was one night when she wanted me to take a sleeping draught. She said I needed rest. There was something in her face, and I poured it away. That was when I began to believe her mind was going. Poor Bella. She was much too good for me, always. A very odd epitaph, I thought, for a self-confessed murderess. There remained only one other little matter to be sorted out. 
Come on, old man. You can't take your ball out on a walk, you know. Go and put it down. <laughs> My word, Pyro, it's good to have a dog again. The spoils of war, Hastings. Well, now that Little Green House is on the market again, and Miss Lawson has decided to share her fortune with the Arundels and the Tanyos children, somebody's got to take care of Bob. I was under the impression that Miss Lawson had given him to me. But you be no good with a dog, Poirot. You're not familiar with dog psychology. Hmm. Hmm? Try it. Go on. Try and call him to you. Uh, <coughs> uh, Monsieur Bob. Easy. Venezi see, Bob. No, you see, he won't budge. He knows who his master is. <laughs> we understand each other perfectly, don't we, Bob? 